I have used a slightly different title, but it's the same theme. I did listen to the latter part of Allison's talk, and uh, one thing that resonated with me is Feynman's quote. So although I'm not a Nobel laureate, uh, as a machine learning researcher, it's sometimes hard for me to decouple um, principles from implementation, right? And so the first question I always ask is, how do I translate any of these empirical observations or principles um, into an algorithm? And how can I um, code it up? And is it efficient? Um, math has always been the language of choice for bridging this gap, right, in various disciplines in physics, um, chemistry, and, and neural processes are no different. Uh, but there are many different frameworks we can draw from, and in the recent past, I've gravitated towards information theory, theory as a very useful framework um, for conceptualizing ideas and also translating them to um, efficient algorithms and, and code at the end of the day. Um, Though I don't work on super exciting things like organoids, I come from more of a machine learning research perspective. And Allison did touch on sort of the state of the art in machine learning and why we're beginning to look towards biology for inspiration. My, my long-term objectives are to formalize connections between mechanisms that we observe in biological systems and AI algorithms using precise information theoretic principles. Um, of course, that's a tall order. So uh, my objective for this talk is spe specifically is to motivate people smarter than me, so this audience, to start thinking uh, in this direction to begin with, right? And now Microsoft is a for-profit organization. So we'd like all of this to eventually have some economic footprint, right? And in my opinion, um, efficient learning is one of the most pressing challenges in AI. And also an aspect where a biological system, that is the human brain, is orders of magnitude more efficient. And we can characterize and compare learning systems across many dimensions, right? I've summarized five key dimensions that, um, that, that we kind of consider as guiding lights for what we think of as being efficient. First one is computational efficiency, right? Which refers specifically to compute requirements, including memory, size of the model, number of operations, um, that a model entails. And of course, uh, one summary metric could just be the total energy that's consumed or power, right? Um, and of course, this has to do almost exclusively with the model definition and the model parameters. And generally speaking, smaller models lead to more, um, if, more computationally efficient models. Sample efficiency, on the other hand, refers to the number of samples that we require to achieve a certain level of representation capacity, right? So uh, let's say we're trying to build a simple classifier that can distinguish between cats and dogs. Learning to do that with just 10 examples is a lot more powerful than learning to do that with 100,000 examples, right? So not only does this result, result, result in significant data savings and um, efficient mechanisms, but note that computational efficiency and sample efficiency are not orthogonal principles, right? So um, the total number of operations reduces if the total number of um, examples we operate on also reduces. And um, next is generalizability. And as the name suggests, it indicates how well the systems extend to previously unseen scenarios. Um, adaptability is also a related concept um, that characterizes how the system can adapt to new tasks. And we, these get more and more advanced uh, principles that we want to achieve, right? So um, I'm using reasoning as an umbrella term that captures any higher level cognition, symbolic reasoning, and, and other advanced properties. So the, the definition, at least my definition, gets increasingly imprecise as we go from computational efficiency to sample efficiency to generalization. Um, adaptability and reasoning, right? And, and also, I think the bottom line with respect to efficiency um, is also more precise when we just talk about computational efficiency. Right? So let's start with that. Why do we want to do this? Like, why is efficiency such an important problem? Just earlier this week, Microsoft announced the Megatron Turing natural language generation model which is the largest and most powerful language model to date. Um, with over 530 billion parameters, it was trained on about 4,500 top of the line GPUs. Um, I did some back of the envelope calculations and simply purchasing these GPUs at MSRP 
would cost a hundred million dollars, right? And if that's not concerning enough, uh, notice the trend here, where there's an exponential growth um, in the model sizes, right? So um, up until last year, there's no model that exceeded 10 billion parameters. And just in this year or the last year, there have been at least a few trillion parameter models reported, right? There's the Microsoft Megatron Turing NLG, which was just announced last week. There are these mixture of expert models such as switch transformers that operate at a trillion parameter that, that operate on the order of trillion parameters. And so, and so we don't know what's coming next, right? There, uh, we hypothesize that the models will continue to grow because we've learned to, uh, we've learned to learn, no pun intended here, to, to train these models on increasing amounts of data. So as the model parameters increase, model capacity grows, we can continue to um, train on, we, we can crawl pretty much everything that's ever been published and, and train gigantic learning machines. And all of these models rely on what we call the transformer architecture. And there have been several attempts to find efficient alternatives, right? Um, you can think of the transformer as learning associations between words or sentences or tokens. Um, it, it can, it, and think of it as a fully connected graph, right? So all of these um, other alternatives that include random projections, convolutional alternatives and sparsity um, attempt to minimize the, um, the quadratic complexity of both memory and compute of, of the transformer um, module. Um, none of these are close to achieving the level of efficiency we see in biological systems. Now, um, I'm not a biologist, but I've often seen the word uh, 20 watts or 40 watts reported for the power consumption of our brains. Um, well, Megatron Turing with the 4,500 GPUs requires 1.3 million watts of power, and it, it, it still can't achieve uh, a fraction of what the human brain can, right? And th that goes back to, of course, um, hardware implications, and, and of course, there's, there's interesting discussions about organo organoids and so on. But my interest lies in the, at the algorithmic level, right? So there must be some sort of a gap even at the algorithmic level that we can we can bridge. And there are several mechanisms we can attribute to um, for our brain's efficiency, right? And this this is by no means an exhaustive list. It doesn't include the complex mechanisms, like I said, fundamental dif differences in the hardware or software. So all of these are specifically algorithmic directions that I'm talking about. So um, low precision refers to the fact that um, current computing systems are designed for high precision tasks, right? So if you were to multiply three six-digit numbers. Um, a, a computer can do it in um, a fraction of a second. Uh, it will take uh, a person, I don't know, hour, an hour or half an hour to write, write down the, the multiplication and follow through with it, right? But on the other hand, we're extremely good at inference tasks and so on. Um, sparsity is, um, let me just briefly define it as uh, a setting where a, a large number of parameters are zero. Um, so this is useful because um, it, it tends to be compressible. So think, think of compression as compressing an image using JPEG or something, or, or a zip file even, right? So when you have a picture um, of, of, let's say you have two pictures, one picture with just um, blue sky in the background and another picture with a lot of texture, you can encode all of those pixels as just blue, right? And that leads to better compressibility and that has to do with uh, the notion of sparsity. So in addition to that, most uh, modern computing um, architectures can circumvent zeros, right? So um, deep learning relies on multiplication and addition and most, and, uh, most computers can skip that, uh, that operation if they see a zero. So rather than multiplying um, four times zero, you actually just skip that compute. And so that leads to also some efficiency in computation. There are, of course, other principles such as local updates and associative learning that we know um, humans are capable of, but um, are, are currently limitations in uh, machine learning systems. So given that, I just want to go back to the goal that I initially stated, which is to formalize some of these mechanisms in the context of information theory. And so why information theory? Because 
biological systems and artificial intelligence models, um, deep learning specifically in, in, in my case, but even other machine learning systems um, can be seen as dynamic stochastic processes, um, which makes them amenable to information theoretic metrics such as um, entropy and mutual information at various levels of granularity, right? That is, we can reason uh, these notions at an intuitive level where entropy is uh, it defines some notion of uncertainty and even precise mathematical and algorithmic levels. I also believe that information theory might already be that common language with prior applications in neural processes as well as deep learning. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, the goal is to develop new machine learning systems that are efficient. So um, having that underlying math makes it easy for someone like me to uh, look, at, look at these equations and translate them to efficient code. And here's one example uh, of a prior application to neural coding. I'm not a neuroscientist and it's by no means an exhaustive literature review, but it goes to show the utility um, of um, information theory and analyzing neural systems, right? So this chalk, chalk and all show in their a PNAS paper that um, efficient coding occurs when um, the information between the response at time t and the stimulus at time t plus delta is maximized. And the information between the response at time t and all prior history is minimized. So in other words, neural encodings are suggested to be efficient if we ensure that the current response is aligned with future stimuli. And surprisingly, a very similar property has emerged in the deep learning um, literature as well, known as the information bottleneck principle. Just uh, to correct that, information bottleneck did not emerge uh, from the deep learning literature. It was it emerged from sort of the statistics community, but it's been recently applied to um, deep learning as well. Um, the goal of efficient learning can be defined as maximum compression of the input data or stimulus um, here, that's denoted by X here such that we maximize the association with the output Y, which can be labels of a supervised classification task. So in, in these equations, um, X denotes the input data, T denotes some aggregate notion of the hidden representations. It could be each of these hidden layers of the network or a concatenation of all of these, depending on the application we have in mind. And um, Y represents the label. So let me present another illustration, thanks to um, Tishby and all. Um, here, suppose we have an image, right? And this is an image of a dog and we'd like to train a classifier for labeling a new unseen image as, as a dog. Um, the network is defined by layers of artificial neurons, each of which learns higher and higher levels of representation. Now the network effectively compresses all the pixels, right? So if you think of this input image as uh, in its pixelated form, it's a very high dimensional representation, right? Let's say the, the input image is 256 by 256. That's a lot of pixels that represent just, just the image of a dog. And the idea is that not all of those pixels are relevant, right? So the network, as we progress through the training, effectively compresses all the pixels of the image by discarding details that are irrelevant for the prediction task and retains only the information that is relevant for that particular task. And this is in the context of a supervised classification problem. And this curve on the left here quantifies um, the process very well, where here A, B, C, D, and E refer to different stages of the training. So A is the very beginning of, uh, of, um, of the training curve and E is at the very end. And each of these are different, each color represents a different layer. Let's just look at the last layer of the model here. So initially the last layer has almost no information about the input um, X, right? And it progressively learns more in information about both the input and the label. So the, uh, as we go up, up in the Y axis, we're learning more and more information about that particular label, in this case, the dog. Um, and we keep going until we've learned um, a little bit about both the input and the output. And we then, uh, and this is a natural evolution of the training uh, algorithm itself, right? So this is a standard convolutional model trained with um, stochastic gradient descent. Once we hit this inflection point or 
it's also referred to as the phase transition, um, we start discarding information. So these are again, things that may, maybe don't matter. For example, the background in blue maybe is completely irrelevant um, for, for predicting that it's a dog. And these uh, curves are called information planes and we can immediately start characterizing um, some of the mechanisms we discussed earlier, right? So um, all three curves correspond to the exact same model here, trained on the exact same data for the exact same task, which is in this case, MNIST digit recognition. Um, the first graph corresponds to training on just 5% of the data, however. Um, the second graph corresponds to training on 45% of the data. And the third graph, which you call sort of near complete data set, trains on 80% of the data. You can see that in all three cases, the uh, information between X and T. So just to recap, X is the input, T is some notion of hidden representation, Y is some notion of the label, right? So in this case, X would be images, T would be some learned representation, and Y would be the label um, of the digits themselves. You can see that in all three cases, um, the images are almost equally compressed, right? So I of X, T is one in all of these cases. So it's one here when we train on the full data set, it's one here when we train on about half the data. And it's also one here when we train on just 5% of the data. But the I of TY, that is our, uh, the information that the hidden representation captures about the label is drastically different. And uh, it's intuitively obvious that with just 5% of the data, we don't learn as much as we do with about 50% of the data, 45% of the data versus the full data set, right? But what this gap also suggests is one way to characterize sample efficiency, right? So um, this, for a particular application, perhaps this, this gap isn't as significant and maybe just training with half the data suffices. And since the characterize, and, and the more important part here is that this characterization depends entirely on information theoretic measures, right? So these are numerical, estimates of what we think is happening, uh, both in terms of learning the representations and in terms of compression. So we can construct a similar graph for biological system as well, either using a model for neural processes or directly from empirical measurements. So I really believe that further research in this direction can inform rigorous comparisons between biological systems, um, biologically inspired machine learning models, and of course, state-of-the-art deep learning. So I suspect the workflow would look as follows, right? So let's take some desired property um, of a biological system, such as local learning, um, identify its impact on the information bottleneck. That is, how does local learning bend that information plane we just explored? And explore a number of different algorithmic approaches that can induce the same characteristics. Um, and these, these algorithms do not have to be necessarily bio-inspired, right? We're likely going to succeed if they're bio-inspired, but there are lots, and that's the gap that I'd like to address, is there are lots of biologically inspired um, techniques or approaches that are not necessarily directly implementable in the, in the context of state-of-the-art deep learning models. So as the proxy, let's take computationally feasible aspects that we can implement that achieves the same mechanism and, and the way we characterize and quantify that mechanism is with the information bottleneck. And, and then of course we can repeat this process indefinitely until, until we achieve our long-term goal, goals uh, or get, get close to achieving our long-term goals.